Hello everyone, my name is Steve Lewis and today we're going to talk about glioblastoma. I'm making this presentation for my cancer biology class, but it's something that is also very personally important to me. So, as with all of my presentations, I want to start out talking about why do I care about it. A couple years ago, in 2012, my dad passed away from glioblastoma, um, which is a highly malignant form of brain cancer. And so here's a couple of pictures um, just signifying kind of what glioblastoma means to me. I did a race a couple years ago um, in DC uh, with an organization called ABC Squared, which is the Accelerate Brain Cancer Cure. And then also this is a team that I uh, get together with every year to kind of raise money for the Livestrong Foundation. And to date, we have raised uh, nearly $50,000 for the Livestrong Foundation in my dad's memory. And so that is why glioblastoma is important to me. So jumping right in, glioblastoma is a grade 4 glioma. And it was formerly, literally up until 2014, known as glioblastoma multiform, or GBM. It is the most malignant form of astrocytoma, and what differentiates it is it presents with necrosis, which is dead cells, and also angiogenesis. Um, and so it's pretty, it, it's a pretty developed, it's a highly aggressive form of brain cancer that also has a lot of... Uh, issues associated with it, including cancer recurrence. So just a little bit um, about the epidemiology, the in incidence and patient demographics. Males are effect affected more frequently than females, and about 50% of all gliomas are glioblastomas. Uh, the National Cancer Institute's SEER program lumps brain cancers and nervous um, system cancers uh, statistics together. And so... Of those cancer types, there were 14,320 deaths in 2014. So you can see it's a pretty rare uh, rare cancer, but it is really aggressive with only a 33.4% uh, five-year survival rate as of 2014. Um, and this uh, image that I've included here at the bottom uh, only goes to 2006, but there's actually uh, a little bit of progress that's been made using immunotherapies uh, that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes um, since 2006. And so the uh, five-year relative uh, patient survival rate is actually uh, improved since this image, but this is the one that I got from the NCI's website. Uh, so let's talk about causes and uh, prevention. Unfortunately, there are no known causes, and prevention appears impossible. Um, and it's primarily primarily caused by genetic reprogramming, and it arises basically out of nowhere from normal brain tissue. Old subtypes included de novo, which means new or primary. Uh, they arise quickly, typically in patients 55 or older, and it's really, really aggressive. And then secondary, which is where the, the glioblastoma arises at, uh, out of a brain cancer called an astrocytoma that was already there and then became malignant. Uh, with a lot of uh, glioblastomas, uh, the growth factor receptors are either mutated or overexpressed, and we've seen that with EGFR, VEGF, and PDGFR. Um, and so this is interesting because there are uh, uh, clearly things that are going wrong with the transduction pathways in the uh, glioma cells. And so more recently, we actually have gotten the opportunity um, or Phillips and Verhock, I should say, have come up with a molecular subtyping scheme for uh, glioblastoma. It is not, um, or it's pretty recent, actually, I should say. Uh, 2012 was when this uh, these two groups kind of uh, came up with the molecular subtyping, so I'll go over a couple of those. Uh, first of all, I want to say that glioblastomas are uh, have high heterogeneity, meaning the cells of the brain tumor are not the same. They're not similar to one another um, in most cases. And so what happens is uh, you have different things going wrong in different cells. So unfortunately, what that boils down to is that there's not going to be a universal cure for glioblastoma, um, at least at this time. But there is a way to kind of subtype, uh, have categories for the glioblastomas uh, that 
sometimes happen. And so the first uh, group grouping is proneural, and it has a p53 and a platelet de derived growth factor receptor A mutation. Um, and th these do not respond to chemotherapy, so that's pretty interesting. Um, and when you can when you contrast that with let's say the mesenchymal, um, the, these are these forms of glioblastoma are due to um, NF the NF1 gene, a mutation in the NF1 gene, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, but it's pretty interesting that we are now able to subtype uh, the different types of glioblastoma. And what's great and very encouraging about this is that we ultimately, uh, the more we are able to subtype, the more we can kind of find targeted therapies for uh, the for the uh, for glioblastoma. So potential causes. Um, I included this slide just to talk about, uh, you know, what could potentially cause glioblastoma, but I'll, I'll talk about why that's kind of disheartening <laughs> to do it. Basically, um, we're kind of just casting a wide net at this point. Viral infections, malaria, lead exposure, all of these things have been associated with glioblastoma. Um, correlations have been found, but again, those are so different. One of, you know, it's viral, bacterial, lead exposure, it's all over the place. So we really don't know the causes, like I said earlier. Um, risk factors, again, males 50 plus already having an astrocytoma. Um, one of the things that's, uh, that, that is good news, though, is that the majority of glioblastomas are not hereditary. Uh, with that said, there are about 5% that appear to be caused by an inherited syndrome. Uh, and so I was mentioning on this previous slide here that Mutations in the NF1 gene uh, can can predispose you to getting glioblastoma, and so NF1 is neurofibromatosis, and it's pretty interesting um, that this gene can be a risk factor for glioblastoma because all of these uh, syndromes here, except for one of them, present with really interesting. Um, it, it, issues with the skin. Um, a lot of patients' uh, chest and back often have issues with um, the skin cells that are pretty visible. And it's pretty fascinating that this is a systemic thing and can lead to glioblastoma. So it kind of gives credence to the idea that there is, um, you know, potentially more going on with glioblastoma than meets the eye, um, especially if we can kind of narrow it down into like categories of other diseases if we're talking about, let's say, uh, some kind of dermatological issues. So just interesting things to keep in mind, but again, the majority are not hereditary um, and very, very few. It's incredibly rare to have it uh, as inherited. So right now, treatment strategies. Let's just talk about what the standard of care is. You have concomitant Temozolomide and radiotherapy, which is basically chemo and radiation, um, and TMZ is an alkylating agent. And these two things are actually used uh, concomitantly. It's pretty interesting. These two uh, d these two forms of therapy were not approved, uh, not considered the standard of care up until two thousand six. Prior to 2006, it was just radiotherapy that was used for people with brain cancer. Um, but uh, using radiotherapy in conjunction with TMZ did show uh, improvements in survival rates um, and, pro and progression-free survival rates. And so uh, this became the new standard as of 2006. Uh, other options are uh, surgical resection. Uh, you need a biopsy to actually confirm that you have a glioblastoma. A glioblastoma. Uh, one of the things to talk, mention with surgery is that uh, glioblastoma is often highly diffused throughout uh, the brain, and so it's not really an option to do a ton of surgical resection, though it is possible. Um, but again, it's not something that it, it is incredibly easy to do. Something else that's kind of interesting, though, is that you can have uh, what's called a carmustine wafer left in the tumor after after surgery. And this is basically a form of chemotherapy in 
yeah, the form of a wafer, like if you've ever taken communion or something like that, it's literally like a wafer of chemo that uh, can be left in the brain and kind of provide more targeted chemotherapy um, rather than an intravenous um, delivery mechanism. Again, other kinds of therapy include uh, various radiation therapies, including uh, IMRT and IGRT and photodynamic. Uh, it's all of these have been shown to be beneficial um, in certain ways, and that's why it was the standard of care uh, leading up to 2006 when TMZ became the uh, standard in conjunction with it. Other treatment strategies. Uh, let's talk about two kinds of drugs here that are used in the treatment of glioblastoma. You have cytotoxic, which destroys the tumor. So you've got like temozolomide, cisplatin, and carboplatinum. Uh, things to consider with cytotoxic drugs are that there are a lot of side effects. You see people lose their hair. You see people get very nauseous. Those side effects are due to the fact that they're not um, incredibly targeted to just the cancer cells. Uh, they do affect other normal healthy cells as well. And then you've got this uh, other class, cytostatic drugs, which alter tumor behavior. And these are great because these are uh, new and targeted therapies, and that's, that's wonderful. So one of the most recently approved ones is uh, bevacizumab, is how I pronounce it, and it is a monoclonal anti antibody that targets vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, and this is great because it's a antibody uh, that can stop uh, angiogenesis, so it is an immunotherapy. And it was given a conditional FDA approval for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. And it did demonstrate in two, 2013 trials that uh, it to prolong pro progression-free survival. So this is pretty interesting and just another... Uh, area of research to talk about uh, when you're talking about how can we treat cancer, uh, these targeted therapies. Uh, another one is differentiating agents, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, but retinoids like uh, Accutane are currently being looked into uh, to potentially be used to treat glioblastoma. So let's talk about some future directions for treatment and research uh, that is needed in the field. And so as of 2015, uh, it's now April. One of the things that we need most desperately in uh, glioblastoma research is molecular subtyping. If we can know what different what differentiates these glioblastoma cells from other cells, uh, that will make life really easy for actually developing targeted therapies. And so it was really difficult to differentiate those until recently, but when we do uh, find more ways to... Uh, I, new markers to identify, we'll be able to uh, diagnose different forms of glioblastoma, different cells within glioblastomas uh, more accurately, much more easily. Um, other ones we've got uh, coming up are gene expression profiling, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, you can look that up uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, immunotherapies, anti-tumor vaccines are a big uh, area of research right now for how can we prevent cancer from happening. Uh, brain cancer stem cells, that's a very, very new area of research. And uh, other targeted therapies to stop cell signaling pathways. And that's that's uh, these are going to be critical, especially uh, in terms of cancer cells and cancer treatments in the future. Because if we can stop some of these pathways uh, within the just the tumor cells, we can potentially stop the tumor from growing um, and, and kind of make more cytostatic therapies uh, that are targeted. Uh, so in 2013, uh, the, these are just this is slide is more just some like interesting facts um, that that I found that are personally like interesting to me, but I think that they'll be interesting to you as well. So I wanted to share. So glioma stem cells, I mentioned stem cells on the last slide. Uh, they demonstrated preferential activation of DNA damage response. And so I talked for a while about how glioblastoma is such a recurrent uh, form of cancer. You know, you treat it with radiation for three months. And in the case of my dad, he, his was recurrent within two or three 
months, um, I believe. And so it's a highly, highly resistant form of cancer. And so one of the things that is being looked into right now are these glioma stem cells um, that dem- uh, that may be the cause of resistance to radiotherapy. Uh, Another one is the HES3 transcription factor. It is a biomarker for neuro cells that's inhibited by the JAK pathway activity, which is just another kinase pathway. Uh, and it's been shown to reduce the number of glioblastoma cells in vitro. And that makes it a potential therapy. And so one of the things that I highlighted right there is that um, it is in vitro. So the standard right now for glioblastoma treatments is that you do ultimately need to, oops, I apologize for that, is that you do ultimately need to have the patient's actual brain tumor um, xenografted into a mouse to really prove any, any form of efficacy. And so the fact that it was shown in vitro, um, this is wonderful, but it'll be really interesting to see where this HES3 transcription factor goes, uh, in the future, um, just because it did show uh, promise in vitro, but it would be awesome to see it, especially in xenografted mouse models. Uh, Other ones currently in clinical trials, uh, looks like I think this said clinical trials, but that's okay, um, is a a gene transfer therapy. And this is a really exciting area of research too. Um, But one of the things that I really want to highlight here is that patient advocacy groups are incredibly important to glioblastoma research. Uh, Probably the most popular one that I'm aware of is the Accelerate Brain Cancer Cure. Uh, Here is a link to actually see these guys fund uh, trials. They um, have funded a bunch of different studies, a Johns Hopkins study, a uh, cyclin-dependent kinase, a uh, glioma study, and currently they're funding an Accutane uh, retinoic acid study. And so it's interesting because there are a lot of people um, extraneously, like people who are not associated with the government or with the universities who are highly, highly passionate and really, really interested in seeing where this, uh, where the future of uh, glioblastoma research is going. And so it's got a really highly active uh, community. And so I wanted to talk about that just because the community surrounding glioblastoma uh, is really involved and really excited about the potential of future future treatments. And so they're doing something about it. We are doing something about it. We are putting money into it. And so it's, it, it's just highly encouraging to see that people are getting involved. Um, they, in, in actually funding uh, certain studies and certain therapies. And so overall, this has um, been a really, really great experience for me to kind of go into glioblastoma and learn a lot about it. And so I'm really you know, appreciative of the opportunity to share all of this with you uh, and also to learn a bit more about the future directions of where this uh, cancer um it is going and where the treatment of this cancer is going more importantly. So here's a list of my references. And again, um, I really appreciate your time. I hope that you learned something and that you enjoyed my presentation and I'll see you again. Thanks.